Hi, I'm Andy Hart from SPD Automotive and welcome back to Case Studies, our weekly series looking at connectivity, autonomy, shared mobility and electrification within the automotive industry. I hope you're all managing to stay safe and sane while working from home and thanks again for sharing all those questions and comments after the last webinar. This week we're focusing on the future of autonomous vehicles. During the first episode we talked about how there are actually three paths towards autonomy being taken by different segments. Passenger cars are gradually going up the ladder of autonomy as car makers stretch the functionality of ADAS features without removing the responsibility from drivers. The next goal is to offer hands-free driving as a convenience feature, but initially only in simple environments like traffic jams on highways. They'll then very gradually expand the complexity of those environments so that more and more of a car owner's journey can be delivered hands-free. Shared vehicles like autonomous shuttles and robo-taxis are starting at the opposite end of the spectrum with startups and tech giants aiming to deliver high levels of autonomy from day one by piloting technologies in a very small city by city scale. Their next challenge is to get localized approvals for operating those services without the need for a safety driver and then demonstrate that they can scale up their platforms to support new environments across a larger number of cities. The third and often overlooked segment is the delivery vehicles, which are focused on reducing the cost and optimizing the management of door-to-door -door deliveries. They're following a similar path as shared vehicles by targeting high levels of autonomy at an earlier stage of the journey, but potentially face fewer legal and technical hurdles to reaching a commercially viable approach. That's a top level summary of what we discussed in the first episode. We're joined today again by Alan, who heads up our autonomous research team, and Deepa, one of our senior specialists, who's been involved in over 50 projects focused on ADAS and autonomy. Welcome to you both. Hi, nice to be back. Hi, Andy. Thanks for having me on this platform today. Deepa, I'd like to start with you and talk a bit more about CarMaker's strategies. Your team creates massive databases showing different OEM ADAS platforms down to a model level. Talk us through some of the different OEM strategies you've seen emerge through your research. So I think we can say the last seven years has been an interesting time for OEMs, especially when we look at introducing ADAS. And uh, the whole ADAS aspect probably gained more traction in 2013, primarily driven by Urain Cap. So they encouraged OEMs to offer ADAS as part of their five-star rating, really. And over the years, this, we can say, has still been a key driver to ADAS fitment. But what we also know recently is the upcoming European mandate, which will make a lot of these safety features standardized in the years to come. And if we look from the OEM's perspective, it's quite clear that they are doing their best to this increasing challenge. So at SPD's data points over the years, it shows us in 2015, we know only 44% of vehicles were offered with AEB in Europe. And if we look at 2020, this fitment is now currently at 85%. And that's a massive increase in probably five years timeframe that we're talking. And the other noticeable change we see is in the way the ADAS is bundled and offered from OEMs. So if, we, if I look at the premium OEMs, they tend to offer mainly two different aspects. One is they are going for a very basic sensor, which will go on their entry and premium segments, and it probably helps them qualify for the star rating. But they can also go to the extensive approach of sometimes having 20 different sensors for supporting 10 different applications. And whilst we look at the volume OEMs, some tend to have a more aggressive strategy. Toyota is one good example. They've taken the approach of standardizing their sensor fusion, which is the radar camera solution on most of the vehicle models, simply to support the increasing Euro and cap requirement. So all these different strategic offering from various OEMs also, what we're starting to see is, you know, there is some sort of emergence in the sensor fusion ACU or what we can call the ADAS domain ECU. 
So whilst I focused on the OEM so far, I just also want to have a little bit on the regional aspects because there's clearly a lot of difference in ADAS fitment when it comes to regions. So if we take the traditional ADAS, Europe is way ahead in terms of market penetrations compared to the US. However, if we look at you know, the L2 Plus, which offers the brief hands-off driving, Clearly, US is leading the way because there is a, a far more vehicles which offer that sort of feature in comparison to Europe. And then looking at China, in terms of ADAS, they are still a little bit further back compared to Europe and US. But we also know that the market's going to have a, a significant growth as they mature over the coming years. And also what is interesting is in China, we know consumers have the purchasing power, but they also like to have quite a bit of technology on their cars. And that's what we see from some of these Chinese premium brands, which are starting to appear now, like Neo and Xpeng. They don't just offer basic ADAS, but they also offer the L2 Plus, you know, which has taken a long time to be introduced in Europe. Excellent. Um, and Alan, from your side, I, I saw uh, last week an article about BMW and they were speaking about their vehicle architecture strategy for supporting autonomous car. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what they shared and what your thoughts are on it? Yeah, so what we saw is, um, is a very safety focused and very pragmatic kind of architecture evolution. So from the level one, two, three, four and five of, of autonomy, what we're trying to, to do is have a, a scalable platform. So at the lower level, you would typically have uh, just a single sensor fusion ECU with uh, a couple of radars and, and cameras and maybe some ultrasonics. Um, and that takes you up to a level two of, of autonomy. When you move to level three and four, that's where things start to get a little more complicated because uh, the computer, the machine is starting to be responsible for what happened. So the architecture is reflecting that in the sense that as you move to level three, then an additional ECU is being introduced. Um, that becomes now the master ECU, where there's a, a lot more sensors, um, in particular there are some LADARs and many more cameras on the lower level. That new domain ECU is, is the master. And then you have a secondary ECU, if effectively it's the one being used at level two or level one, which becomes a, a backup. This is very much a standard approach uh, for functional safety. So what you do, you, you have to partition and do what we call functional decomposition. You partition the burden, if you want, uh, on different ECUs so that when you do the sum of all of them, then you end up with a, a much safer system uh, compared to having just one single ECU. This approach uh, is very pragmatic, it's scalable, um, but it's not necessarily uh, brand new. This is something that's quite well understood and in fact, Cadillac in the US on the uh, on the CT6 uh, has got a, a very similar approach. So the automotive industry, uh, because of its background, is very much safety focused and robustness focused. They're applying the usual techniques and enhancing them to deliver a higher level of autonomy. Since as soon as you move to level three, it's an entirely uh, new game. And the level of robustness um, you need to achieve is much much higher than at uh, the uh, level two and, and lower obviously mm, makes sense yes yeah, it's, it's interesting looking at some of our research it, it looks like bmw has um, one of the highest penetration rates when it comes to more advanced features like piloted driving um, compared to other brands do you think the uh, this this new approach to their platforms or their architecture will en enable them to scale up in terms of uh, more affordable hardware or platforms, or is it not related that much to the cost? No, it is very much related to the cost. It's it's a it's a pragmatic way to try to spread the cost, because what what you don't want is to have a, a very powerful ECU sitting on the car not doing very much. So it's very important to match what the consumer is going to want and need and pay for eventually with the computing power. You don't want to uh, have two. Uh, too much resources not being used. So that, that's one of the, of the reasons. And also, I mentioned Cadillac, but if you also look at the Audi A8, so we've got the so-called the Z-Fast controller, and that comes into four different flavors. So depending on, on the level of equipment that uh, the consumer is asking, 
and paying for, then you have a different level of, of ZFast controller. So the inside of the of the domain issues get decontented if you just go for the uh, very low level of functionality. But if you go for the top level, then uh, you have the, the full board being populated um, with, with all the, uh, the chipset required. That's really interesting. A lot's been made of the fact that Tesla's valuation is is so high and more than many OEMs that have many times more unit sales. That seems to be partly driven by investors seeing a strategic value in Tesla's autonomous platform. In your opinions, how much of an advantage does Tesla currently have and, and will it be hard for others to keep up? Tesla is a very interesting because the valuation of Tesla is, is absolutely incredible uh, if you compare with uh, the likes of Ford or, or GM. So it's sometimes a bit puzzling why it is valued uh, at such a high level. What, one thing that is quite unique to Tesla, and certainly for me, one of the uh, very early adopters of this, is their capability of doing OTA, so over the air software download. So they can update the vehicle very, very quickly um, during the whole life cycle of the vehicle. In itself, it's not groundbreaking, but they were one of the very early ones to adopt this. What is really an advantage, once you've got OTA, you can have access to data from the car. And what Tesla is effectively doing is using its customers as a way of crowdsourcing information for training their algorithm. So a simple example, let's say you've got a collision avoidance system that has been trained to only react to pedestrian. You might have a very good system, but all of a sudden, you end up in cities and e-scooters are appearing. And those were never part of the initial set of, of data you were, you were training your algorithm. And if you want now to enhance the functionality and break and avoid collision with e-scooters, what Tesla can do, it can interrogate the vehicles it's got around the world and ask them to push back to their cloud pictures of an e-scooter. Very quickly, they can end up with a very, very large data set for training purposes and then validation. Now that's quite unique. Um, many OEMs are trying to do that, but they're not there yet. It's interesting, yeah. It certainly sounds like an advantage. It seems incredible given the fact that there's a smaller number of Teslas out there on the road that they can build up such a large data set. I'm guessing having full control over their stack must help to some extent. Other OEMs maybe that um, rely more on their tier one suppliers, potentially, I guess, would find it harder to, to build up their own database of images or of radar data uh, to be able to generate the kind of value that Tesla is generating, do you think? Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's clearly an advantage that's going to be very, very hard to, to actually uh, bridge. It's Tesla probably got half, half a million vehicle out there running. So it's not a small fleet size. And now they can really access a very large amount of data. And it's really the power of crowdsourcing. Having said that, it doesn't mean that they're going to keep that edge all the time. What I like to really reinforce is that, yes, when you've got that capability, you can very quickly get to some quite acceptable level of functionality. But the devil is in the details. And as you get closer and closer to um, wanting to move towards a high level of autonomy, so moving from level two to level three, the goalposts moved a lot. And it gets a lot harder to uh, reach the summit, if you want. Even though they have that great capability uh, for potentially getting quickly to the summit, so to speak, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get there first, necessarily. Uh, other companies are using slightly more traditional approach, uh, much more model-based. The simulation environment has made massive improvements. And you can do a huge amount of software development through simulation. I mean, Tesla is doing simulation, clearly, as well but is relying a lot more on data collection. So it's, it's finding the right balance between, between the two. And as the simulation environment becomes uh, even more capable and you, you can get to the so-called the digital twin, so a, a real, a, a very accurate representation of the world digitally that you can then modify uh, endlessly, that gives you then the ability to simulate all sorts of scenarios and validate your algorithm. So really the two approaches are happening at the same time. And um, yes, Tesla has got an advantage so far. Will they keep it? Um, I'm not so convinced all the time. Mm. Deeper, Waymo is seen as another disruptor in this space. Why do you think OEMs would consider partnering with Waymo? And why might some be nervous to jump on Google's bandwagon? So if we look, Waymo's parent company, Google, is not a new player in the auto industry. And they have supported OEMs in the infotainment side for a few years. 
we all know now the OEMs are very eager to introduce autonomous vehicles and therefore all the companies that are supporting the OEMs are also trying to expand their offering. And with autonomous vehicles, there are two key things which are very important. One is the software aspect and the other is the validation aspect. And if we take Waymo, they're quite strong in both these aspects and therefore they become a very interesting or an attractive partner for some OEMs. In looking at the validation side, you know, to make sure that the software works in every possible scenario with different road challenges, there needs to be a lot of uh, mileage accumulation driving millions of kilometers. With a, a ride sharing platform like Waymo, it probably gives access to valuable data and how systems perform when they're driven in the real world scenarios. And the industry probably is well aware that, you know, Waymo has many millions of self-driven uh, miles on public roads, about 20 million, and uh, several billions in terms of simulation. So that validation aspect is something that Waymo are quite strong on. And looking at the other aspect of the software, OEMs know and acknowledge the importance of having a strong software division. So by partnering with someone like Waymo, um, it's beneficial. They have the software know-how and the capabilities without having to build everything from ground up. But it also challenges their value proposition because they have such heavy reliance on you know, software companies. But what's interesting is how the industry has kind of changed its view. So if we went a few years back, it was clear that tech companies were direct competition to OEMs, but now things are different. Some tech companies have realized that producing cars are not easy. Generally speaking, within the industry, there's so much more acknowledgement on the fact that the whole autonomous vehicle is a much more collaborative approach. They acknowledge that there needs to be a lot of sharing and knowledge transfer, but it's still a space that needs to be watched and seen how much of that knowledge transfer is really going to happen. What I can see is there might be like different groups. So there might be a group of OEMs who want to retain control, will probably have the complete ecosystem and try to be involved in all the pieces of the puzzle. There's probably going to be one group which relies on their traditional suppliers and probably expect them to deliver an end-to-end -end solution. And there might be the other group where you know they work along with the tech companies investigating and developing the software together. The other thing that I really want to also stress on is the race for autonomy is still there, but the pace is slowing down simply because of the challenges and how the industry is now really admitting that getting to a level three, a credible level three or a safe level three is a lot more challenging than anticipated and therefore it's going to take a lot longer and therefore we see um, the urgency for delivering this level three is slowly disappearing. And I think overall, the belief that you know, tech companies are disruptors is now probably starting to change with the fact that the challenge ahead needs a lot more collaborative approach rather than a silo approach. Yeah, it makes sense. It's quite interesting because last week we were talking about Google in the context of connected cars and looking at Android Auto, Android Automotive in the car which is the other part of their kind of automotive strategy when it comes to things like infotainment. And at least on that side of, of the puzzle, it always has felt like there's been a cultural misalignment between the tech companies and the OEMs who are looking to integrate that technology into their cars. Uh, and we often found that whilst OEMs would have big teams of engineers doing a lot of design and validation and testing um, of the integration of things like Google or Apple into the car, the teams on the on the tech side were often a lot lighter and they were stretched really thin across having to, to manage requirements from a very large number of OEMs because I think they're just a, a lot more used to working in an agile manner with smaller teams. Does any of that kind of cultural misalignment happen on the autonomous side in your view or do you think Waymo is well enough equipped to be able to work with OEMs? Well, what I see is because there's so many aspects to these autonomous vehicles, 
if we take the OEM's perspective and if having to retain control and having to do everything from end to end is suddenly going to be a challenge, it's going to stretch them. And therefore, the issue could then be not having the same extensive level of software knowledge like the tech companies and the agile working mode of the tech companies. Are they going to be in a position to constantly update and keep these autonomous vehicles safe? And therefore, you need to have that robust partnership someone whom you can rely on, someone who you know would deliver the right quality, the right level of safety to make sure that you're working with them to get the vehicles to a, a much more safer level for a safe environment on the road. And therefore, that, that really would get the public's trust. So I think it's, it's trying to balance that for the OEM where, whilst you focus on the core aspects, but you also focus on the software aspect, but maybe take the help of a much more knowledgeable or uh, the expertise from software. I guess it's very difficult, isn't it, to balance that need for partnerships versus the OEM's natural instinct to, to need or to want to control, um, particularly when it comes to safety, the, the technology in the, in the experience of their cars. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Alan, I had a, a question for you. Deepa had mentioned China earlier uh, when she was talking about lower levels of autonomy. I checked our autonomous guide earlier uh, today, and I noticed that there are now 20 pilots in China, more than any other region. They seem to be carving out their own approach to autonomous vehicles over there. Can you talk us through some of the differences that you see between China and other markets? China is a very interesting region to look at. Maybe just going back a little bit in a couple of years, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's worth remembering that the automotive industry in China has been built over 30 years. I mean, 30 years ago, there were virtually nothing. So in the space of 30 years, we managed to create a massive industry, as well as being the number one market in terms of, of volume. One of the big difference um, between China and the rest of the, of the world is speed. They can do things very, very quickly. The other difference is that because of the government, because there's a very strong incentive from the government, uh, they got the five-year plan. So they, they are able to focus the mind and focus the, the attention and everybody's kind of work in the same sort of direction. Uh, that's something that we, we don't experience in, in Europe, for example. So that is one advantage that everybody's kind of working in, in a kind of a similar direction. And one example is uh, standardization. If you take EV, uh, electrical vehicle, in China, there is only one type of plug. You don't, you know, in, in Europe, we have multiple. Uh, so that, that gives them the speed again. Uh, so that uh, you don't waste time and money on, on different standards and, and different uh, uh, application. The other aspect of, of China, uh, again, where it, it's quite a bit different, is the fact that they are, in some aspects, they are far more advanced, uh, especially in terms of online payment. In China, it's very, very common to pretty much do everything with your phone. Uh, having a credit card or having a cash on you is, is not so critical in China. You can, you can do pretty much everything you need through your phone. And that is, is something that's, you know, they are way ahead of, of any other region, maybe with the exception of South Korea, for, for that type of thing. So what we mean is that the technology is moving ultra fast in, in China. Over the last 30 years, what happened as well in the automotive industry is that initially the cars being produced were, quite frankly, um, well, they're very cheap, but quite dangerous. Uh, the safety standards uh, were not quite the same. It's a very different story now. You, you get cars in China and produced by local brands, uh, which are reaching five star uh, at CN cap. Um, CN cap is not as demanding as UN cap, but still, uh, most of the cars coming out of, of China now have got some very good rating in terms of um, UN cap. And if that's just in the space of, of, of 10 or 15 years, the, the quality in Chinese cars has increased tremendously, the safety as well as the technology content. One example to illustrate, illustrate this is we mentioned earlier on, so Xfang is a, pretty much a, it's a small company. They got created uh, six years ago, and now they have two cars uh, in production. The last one that we actually released is the P7. Now that vehicle is a, it's an EV. It's got a lot of sensors on it. It's a probably capable of level three. The operating system on the car itself has been developed in-house. A lot of the software stack has been developed in-house. And that is something that is a threat really to many other, well, to some T1s, but also to other OEMs, uh, is the fact that 
some Chinese companies now are able to develop a lot internally. So the R&D is much more integrated compared to other, other regions. So the know-how has been acquired. Uh, they can now develop things themselves and become innovative. And just to mention again the P7, uh, that car, uh, pretty much all the vehicle settings can be modified and changed purely by voice. And it's that brand, x is is a Chinese brand for Chinese. They don't really have any views of kind of expanding outside of China, not not currently at least. So we are seeing now that even in the premium segment, having Chinese brand premium are starting to appear. So it'd be fascinating to see how those uh, those brands are going to evolve, and especially if they start to get exported to outside China. Mm, absolutely. Deepa, your team has been involved in, in some interesting consumer research studies. A few of them were quite surprising, actually, when you taught me through. Uh, can you tell us what you have seen consumers sharing with you in terms of their attitudes about autonomous cars? I think when we do consumer studies, generally speaking, it's it's very, very interesting. A, a common theme we, we have seen appear, you know, over the years that we have done consumer study is the misunderstanding of ADAS. Simply to put it, I think consumers generally tend to overestimate the capability of the systems. A few years back, we did consumer testing and focus group in the US where we focused, uh, you know, just specifically on semi-automatic parking system. And what we could see was consumers were very eager to try the system, but they obviously expected that it do all the aspects like the braking, steering and acceleration when we knew that those systems were not capable of doing all three. They would probably did a little bit of steering and acceleration, but certainly not braking. And when we tried to explain that to customers, they found it quite confusing. And the most common question was, why, why do you say it only do some bits, but it says the word automatic? And it's very similar when we talk to them about autonomous vehicles, because they think when you mention the word autonomous, everybody just thinks about, you know, the ultimate system, which will drive everywhere, anywhere, no glitches. Uh, they don't have to do anything. Uh, but actually, when we then tell them, OK, that's autonomous vehicle, but it can only do this on a certain type of road, then their interest is quickly gone and they say, well, that's not really autonomous. And, and when you actually look at the cost or ask them about the type of pricing they would consider, um, they're nowhere ready to pay, you know, even what some of the ADAs today are being priced at. So clearly there is some challenge within the issue of consumers willing to pay for safety. Because if we talk to a common man, for them, they already expect that their cars are safe and therefore there is a very obvious question why pay more money for extra safety when you believe your cars are already the best and the safe that you can get possibly so there's a very very cautious approach to accepting vehicle automation and there's still definitely a big challenge in consumers even willing to consider or pay a lot of money for it from their perspective, if you say, you know, it's going from a level two to a level three, for example, it probably looks like a one number jump. But we know the effort that goes on the vehicle in terms of engineering and all the other validation and um, all the other aspects of autonomous vehicles. But that doesn't really translate down to an end consumer. So it's really hard to try and make them understand why the cost is up, but what they see is a very limited automation. Mm, yeah. Um, and I think SPD has been quite uh, stressing the importance of the consumer education aspect because we we know that this is a little bit undermined at the minute. And it's probably, you know, that could be one way to bridge the gap between in the in consumers' mind really, what they expect from their car versus what it actually delivers. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, it feels like a common theme across the whole case spectrum where OEMs risk in some ways pushing forward with a lot of technology, but leaving consumers behind. So you could tick off all of the right boxes of deploying the right technologies, but if you don't wrap it up in the right customer experience and explain it correctly to customers, my um, guess is there's a big risk that customers will, will reject some of this. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because at the end of the day, it, it is being developed for them. So there, there now needs to be this new thinking or the aspect of how do we put this in simple terms to customers who can understand the value of it, but who also appreciate the technological improvement that they receive on their vehicles. Yeah, absolutely. Adam, part of your role is to support technical due diligence of autonomous tech companies on behalf of investors. Where are some of the early signs from an investor's perspective that suggest that an autonomous startup is in a good position? Along the years, we've done quite a few uh, technical due diligence, as, as you said, and um, it's it's quite interesting because we, we see a whole raft of, of level of maturity. I mean, it goes from companies who you could argue all, all they have is a, is a proof concept to others who definitely have something a lot more serious and more mature. One question I like to ask when I do these uh, due diligence exercises is, what is your safety goal? And, and asking that question um, is, and depending what type of answers you get, can really give you a, a lot of insight in where they're at in terms of, of maturity. And clearly companies who cannot easily and clearly define their safety goal and cannot provide KPIs, in other words, data to substantiate their, uh, their safety goal, is clearly a sign of a company who's uh, in the early stages of development. KPI is a very important parameter to analyze and, and there's all sorts of KPIs that we ask about during our due diligence. The other thing we do is we, we, we go on site. So we go and visit the companies. We don't just ask for um, uh, some evidence to be provided to us. We, we'd like to see for ourselves what's out there. So, I mean, sometimes you, you might see companies where there's only a few people, others where there's actually, it doesn't look at all as a startup anymore. It's like a proper a proper company. And then you you you, know, you ask people, you, you go around, you actually try their prototype and we, we validate some test scenarios, we we check some corner cases. Uh, it, it's all about pressure testing and, and asking whether have you thought of this, have you thought of that? And the other thing we actually look at as well is the software development process. Do they have any stringent process in place for controlling the software releases? And the final thing that we, uh, or one of the other things we, uh, we'd like to assess is uh, their understanding of the market and the market needs. Do they really understand the end consumer? Have they got any ideas what the, the potential true customer may want to do? So having that feedback from those companies also gives us another way of assessing how mature they are in terms of the development and whether they're close to having a product that could make it to production uh, or, or whether this is still uh, a proof of concept. Yeah, so they're in a tough spot in many ways. I think all of these startups want to kind of position themselves as the next Elon Musk type character. Um, and to some extent to get funding, they have to overpromise uh, in terms of their capabilities, um, but they always get sucked back into having to have a safe product. Um, so having that kind of split personality in some ways of, of promising the world, but having you know the, the real engineering expertise to make sure that you don't harm anyone, um, it, it's a hard balance to, to reach, isn't it? It is, it is. And uh, you know, some are definitely much better than, than others. And also it depends. I mean, some companies are purely focusing on, on software. Uh, some are purely focusing maybe on some sensor development. Uh, not all companies are looking at the entire uh, software stack. So there are lots of pockets of innovation that are required still to, to deliver a, a fully automated vehicle. So we, we do need all those startups. And I agree, sometimes they, they have to, to blow their own trumpet. Um, but that's part of the game so they can get some some finance. Um, yeah. And without that, I mean, we wouldn't make those massive leap uh, in, in technology. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, as you said, it's a balance. Yeah, one of the, the challenges, I guess, that they face is that from a regulatory point of view, there's still a lot of gray areas out there. Um, I checked our legislation tracker just before we started recording, and they're now almost 20 countries that have specific policies or regulatory initiatives focused on autonomous vehicles. But it still feels quite early on for a lot of these governments. There's no homologation requirements uh, and a lot of city-specific approvals required. I want to thank you both for talking us through the future of autonomous vehicles. We've covered a huge number of topics in a very short amount of time. For all our listeners out there, if you have any questions or feedback on what we've covered today, please do share those with us. Next week, we're going to look at shared mobility, the S in case. 
A few years ago, many were predicting the death of car ownership, but it's been a rough 12 months for shared mobility. A number of high profile services have been withdrawn in the last six months, and COVID is now putting a dent in a lot of startups' ambitions. So next week, we're going to be joined by our head of mobility research, Mo Albador, to look at what all of this means for the future of shared mobility and how some companies have been able to buck the trend and flourish across different markets. So thanks again for joining us. We hope you found it helpful and look forward to seeing you all again next week.